touched on the impact of the removal of the welfare system as it was created um, and how it's changed over time. And you mentioned that um, there's this profit drive now that didn't, that didn't exist before. Um, some people might say, well, what does it matter if someone's making a profit so long as the service is good? Perhaps you could touch a bit on that and talk a bit more about what you see would be the actual impact um, of the removal of our welfare system on the kinds of people and the kinds of communities um, and the lives and the issues that we work with in social work. Okay, so I will take that in three ways. The first, the first question is what's the problem with profit? And that sounds like a strange question because we're, we're told all the time that profit's the heart of the system and nothing can exist without profit. But when you have for-profit organisations brought into public welfare, their fundamental rationale changes because it stops being the public ethos and public service and starts becoming the bottom line. How do you make more money and more profit for your shareholders and for your organisation? And if you are taking wealth out of that system, then there are necessarily less resources available for those at the bottom. It's like inequality. Um, politicians say, well, inequality is not a bad thing. But of course, the problem with inequality is that some people are rich because vast numbers of people are poor. And vast numbers of people are poor because there are a tiny minority in society who are incredibly wealthy. Inequality is a relationship. You have the tiny rich minority because you have the impoverished majority at the bottom and you can't overcome that. That's what inequality is about and the profit motive is about in increasing inequality in that way. So that's one of the reasons. Is it, is the second thing is, well, what, what consequence would it have for communities? Um, I think it's, good, it's worth thinking about an example. So let's take the example of healthcare and let's think of healthcare in Britain, where we have moved away from the model of the NHS as it was established in 48 to some extent. It has been opened up uh, to, to for-profit organisations, but it's still free at the point of use and still primarily funded through taxation. And if you compare that with the system in America, I think you can start to understand what the difference between the two ethos, or ethos of the two systems is. In Britain, if you're the poorest family and your child is ill, you are still guaranteed uh, the service from, from, from the health service. You will still get the doctor. If your child has cancer, you will still get the drugs. You will still have the hospital wards. If your parents are ill, they will still get the treatment that they require. Um, it's getting harder, but you'll still get social care in the community in some way. If we compare that with America, where there's a completely privatised uh, healthcare system, the American healthcare system is fantastic as long as you've got the money or the insurance to access that system. So for the 40% um, in, the, in, the, in the population who have access to that, they have the, some of the best drug treatment, they have the nicest hospitals, the hospitals look like hotels, they have very, very well paid doctors, they have the fanciest machines, they enter hospital and you know, at, at dinner time they have a, a menu to choose from and what wines do you want and it's fantastic at that level, at the very top. And then you have the 60% who have no or inadequate healthcare insurance. And what it means is that if their children are ill, if their children have cancer and the most desperate illnesses, the insurance, they will either have no insurance, in which case they are reliant on Medicaid, which is the most basic level of care, which they will prov probably have to look after their child in their own home. Or if they have basic insurance, they will have some treatment early in the illness, but once the insurance policy runs out, they will have to resort to health care in the home provided by the cheapest medicines with the regular treatment from the doctor and trying to manage all those things. So, privatised health care means fantastic for the minority and disaster for the vast majority, whereas public health, fully funded by the taxpayer, free at the point of use, means that whether you are the richest he or the poorest he, uh, or the richest she or the poorest she, you are entitled to the same uh, kind of treatment, regardless of your wealth or income. Now, of course, the British healthcare system isn't quite like that because we've always had private health beds in it. But I think you can see a, an aspect of that attitude towards health within the, the National Health Service. 
And that ethos, I think, is what we would want in all our services. We want people to have decent homes. They should have gardens. They shouldn't be damp. We should be building more council housing. And we're not doing that because we're opening up the private sector in which there's a housing crisis. But there are building workers who are unemployed. There is people who need houses. I'm not a genius, but I would have thought that the easiest thing to do would be employ the people in the brick factories to make the bricks, employ the joiners, the plumbers and the bricklayers to build the houses and create the homes that people need for, uh, for them and their families to look after. It doesn't seem like rocket science, but it's against the ethos of the market and privatisation. Thank you. It's interesting that you drew that comparison with America as a potentially the trajectory that we're going on um, and a very real example of what it would look like if our welfare mm. system did um, you know, fundamentally change.